Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for bearing with me. I know it's always hard to listen to the third speaker, especially when you've been sitting for a couple of hours. But uh, I promise some multimedia uh, entertainment to uh, keep your interest. <laughs> Um, and I, I just have to say that um, a, a couple of things, I'm going to try to make these, these technological transitions smooth, but I have, I have two excuses. I always think it's good to find a scapegoat. So first of all, I'm going to blame the technology um, because I usually work on a Mac and this is a PC and so this throws me into disarray. And um, I'm also uh, suffering a little bit of jet lag having come back from Copenhagen. So, with, so with, I'll just put those blames out there in case I have some horrible mishap when I switch over to my, to my video. Oh, I, I actually want to take up the themes that, that we have been discussing, and in particular where Matt left off in terms of issues of reframing. And there's a couple of, of reframing, um, I suppose, in, initiatives that I, that I want to undertake. First of all, I want to talk about reframing in terms of climate change, something that, that, that Matt has discussed in, in depth. But also I want to reframe science communication. And we've, we've touched on that, but I'm, I'm going to move into that in a little bit more depth. In recent years, we've seen increasing emphasis placed on public dialogue initiatives that promote engagement with controversial aspects of science, technology, and the environment. Environmental issues, and especially climate change, in this regard, have taken center stage. What we're seeing are experiments to engage citizens in climate policy, and in a sense in climate science, although to a lesser degree, and I'll talk about that just at the end. And one of the reasons for this is, is the arguments behind this is that in order to make our assessments and outcomes more equitable and fair, that we need to engage a range of different stakeholders. And these, are being, these experiments are being pursued in many arenas around the world. Now, many argue that addressing uh, the various problems or, if you will, crises posed by climate change, this requires a participatory form of democracy, the early forms of which are beginning to appear, particularly around issues of science and technology. It is probable that one reason that climate change policies have not been more ambitious or successful is that the publics involved have not been convinced of the seriousness of the problem, as we've discussed, have not been convinced about what measures we could take, um, and or, or simply are, are unwilling to take such measures. Moreover, the recent rise of the, what we'll call the climate denier movement suggests that a portion of the lay public, significant or, or perhaps not, um, but, it, but at least a, a proportion that's notable, is distrustful of scientific institutions and also of the scientists who, who are promoting scientific research. There is, in short, a need to develop more effective ways of engaging uh, publics on climate change issues. You'll notice throughout my talk I'm not, I'm trying to avoid saying the public and to put that very important letter S after <laughs> public because uh, we're not dealing with a monolithic group of people and we often fall into that tendency and if I do please forgive me but, it, but I think we need to think in terms of a plurality of groups that change over space and over time. So, so, so we're definitely not talking in terms of, of monolithic issues. And what follows, I want to provide an overview of public engagement with science. And, and, and this is my little in a nutshell kind of uh, summary. And Matt had, had touched on this. Um, and, and I think it's important to provide an overview because it's very easy for us to fall into our traditional notions of science communication and much, I think, more challenging to think about broader issues of reframing uh, what it is uh, to communicate. I also want to talk about why this matters for issues such as climate change. I'm going to draw from a specific example in order to take that theoretical look into a practical experiment that we undertook at the University of Calgary, but also in conjunction with 38 other organizations in September of this year called uh, Worldwide Views on Global Warming. And to, to conclude, I'm going to outline some of the opportunities and limitations of what is increasingly being called the participatory turn in science communication. And I also want to address what its implications are for uh, climate scientists, and I mean that in, in a broad definition, as well as people who are interested in science communication. So over the past few decades, science communication has gone a remarkable transformation, uh, both in a theoretical venue as well as in, in, in a policy context. From attempts to convey scientific information to, to a lay public, to an emphasis on public engagement. And public participation in science is, is quite difficult to define. So I just want to start with a, a fairly preliminary definition, um, because there's much debate about the boundaries of, of what counts as public participation. This is quite an active area of research right now. It, 
especially conceptually, because I think that the ways in which we approach issues of engagement will also determine what we look for, right? Oftentimes our, our definitions can, can, can draw those boundaries and, and, and have us overlook some, some very vibrant areas. So at least I'll, uh, for a preliminary definition, start with public engagement as being a diverse set of activities whereby non-experts, and I hate that term, I have to say, <laughs> But uh, my other, I, I'm left at, at a little bit of a, a loss for a good term here. It's oftentimes I would say lay public or citizens, but, but people who don't have a specific trained expertise in a particular area. So when we're, in a sense, talking about things outside of our specialization, which we do in everyday life many times, and especially as we, we know that research is becoming increasingly more specialized, we have many opportunities to, to get outside of that, that comfort zone and become non-experts. So these activities um, where non-experts are becoming involved in agenda setting, decision making, policy forming, and knowledge production processes regarding science. So it's everything from science policy right up into um, changes in how we understand science particularly. And, and again, it's really important to distinguish public engagement from traditional forms of science communication because traditional forms of science communication are based on a one-way flow of information, what's called the transmission model or the hypodermic needle model, whichever metaphor helps you understand um, the impulse behind it. And the role of science communication in the traditional regard serves two important functions. It, uh, it serves to provide accurate information in order to to promote and improve scientific literacy. Understood here is the ability to comprehend science as it is provided by particular experts. And then a second goal is to promote favorable attitudes about science. And uh, particularly as we know, because uh, publics serve many roles, one of them is also to support funding for science. So this becomes very important in terms of, of increasing awareness and also support for scientific research. Now, when I'm talking about a traditional model of science communication and, and this turn towards public engagement, I'm not saying that we throw out those very important goals. So I'm not saying that we replace that with public engagement, but that we think about the criticisms that have been, that have been brought forward in terms of the limitations of that particular model of communication. We might think of it as moving from a transmission model to a cultural view of communication. And this is something that, that journalist and scholar uh, James Carey has, not, not the actor, but, <laughs> uh, but actually the scholar ha has noted, is that when we think about communication in a broader, more cultural sense, we start to ask different questions. And there's just a couple of, of, of uh, concerns that have been raised about that traditional model. One is that there is no necessary relationship between the amount of information provided and favorable attitudes towards science. And research has shown a substantial degree of skepticism and suspicion towards science and the scientific method and scientific institutions, even among those who are very well informed. So it, 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 sometimes increased knowledge can actually lead to increased uh, skepticism. The traditional model is also based on the assumption that lay knowledge is inherently inferior to expert knowledge. And I think this is a really crucial point, is that factual information is only one aspect of non-expert knowledge. Public understandings of science are much more sophisticated and nuanced than they have been credited for in the past. And these understandings focus not simply on the content and also processes of science, but also bring into questions, uh, into, into focus, I suppose, questions of context. So we can talk about issues of patronage, power, control, um, as well as broader issues uh, around social inequality and justice. And and a really important shift to take into account is that a vast range of citizens are increasingly unwilling to leave political and moral questions in the hands of technical experts. And by technical experts, I'm, I'm talking about scientists, engineers, but also uh, political representatives. And this is resulting in calls from a range of different actors for much more participatory form of what is being called technological democracy. So it's a bunch of different terms to make sense of, of what is this particular uh, context or conjuncture in which we live. Traditional forms of science communication tend to position non-experts as passive audience members. And there's very little questioning about science in those models as well. So science becomes assumed, unquestioned, and the problem becomes the audience, right? Whether they're uptaking the science or not, whether they're being uh, filled with miscommunication or not, but not actually asking broader questions about what is going on when we talk about communication. 
A, an alternative would be to position lay publics as active citizens who are accorded the rights and responsibilities in a liberal democracy to take part in shaping social agendas and values. And it's particularly that notion of a context of liberal democracy that moves us into a focus on public engagement. And again, I, I want to emphasize that I'm not saying that we don't have a need for accurate information and for good research, so, so please don't misinterpret me, but I want to uh, I, I suppose expand our understanding of communication uh, by emphasizing that it's equally critical to engage with a variety of publics in meaningful dialogue on the ethical and social issues that are surrounding science. So in recent years we're seeing more interactive communication approaches that have emerged generating opportunities as well as tensions. And uh, this is a, actually quite a dated model but because it has uh, stand that stood the test of time I want to bring this up in terms of ways of thinking about participation and the metaphor is quite apt looking at a ladder of participation starting on the, on the bottom where we have non-participation in terms of issues of manip manipulation and coercion um, I like the therapy added into that, uh, to tokenism, which would be issues around informing, consulting, and, and moving up to questions of empowerment so that we're talking about partnership, uh, delegating power in a different way, and then finally up to citizen control. So what this ladder, I think, suggests is that we're talking about a continuum with a range of, of initiatives. And a lot of these initiatives have been borrowed from the field of deliberative democracy. So in a sense, we're seeing the convergence of a field talking about political uh, issues coming together with issues around uh, science and technology. And just to give you a sense of what these initiatives look like, I'm not going to go into specific details about them. Some of you may be uh, familiar with, with various aspects of these or, or have potentially even participated in them. So we might uh, take that ladder and reframe it in terms of issues that from, in, on one level, informing, where the audience is fairly passive, meant to be the recipient of information, to empowering and transforming. And, and just some examples, uh, the, the recent Café Scientifique movement or science cafes, which have been quite popular across uh, the United States and also Canada and, and starting in the UK, but also public lectures that are attempting to make science much more accessible. We also have town hall meetings around, around various scientific issues. Um, and this is particularly relevant in terms of environment and health. Um, and then uh, these new types of, of, of engagement uh, around citizen juries, consensus conferences, and deliberative polling. There's many others, but these give an example of how deliberative democracy methods have come into to informing how we might engage people in science and technology. And then um, I think on the em empower and transform level, we might think about citizen science initiatives where we actually have groups that are, are working to transform their very uh, production of knowledge and, and here a, a classic example would be um, HIV AIDS and patient groups that have worked not only to, to change what we think about science but also the ways in which in which the disease is treated and I, and I want to include activism in here and this is very important for, for issues around climate change because we have protests boycotts and boycotts which if you have not familiar with that term is actually buying things in, in favor of, of, of supporting particular political stances um, and etc because there's many forms of activism now, I, I want to um, shift the discussion a little bit to public engagement with climate change because this is, this is many contexts are involved, local contexts, which, which um, hopefully we'll bring up in our, in our dialogue. But I want to put this into a global context because it's quite significant. And bringing this back to scientific and technological issues, this poses many challenges for citizen participation because on one hand, we have highly specialized, professionalized knowledge that can serve to exclude certain voices. And the values of scientific expertise when we're looking at rigor, discipline, and training training do not neatly align with those of liberal democracy, uh, which, which has a focus on freedom of speech, equality, and what we might call a kind of government by dialogue. So I don't want to resolve that tension. What I want to do is keep that tension actually alive. And I think that might be a really productive way in which we can start to think about engagement. Now, if we take the requisites of democracy seriously, the challenge becomes how to determine the ability of citizens to engage meaningfully in an age dominated by complex technologies and expertise. For some, this entails a shift in cultures of science and technology towards a more reflexive, open, and self-critical forms of expertise. And I think that ties us into questions of uncertainty, which, which I'm going to come to right at the end. 
And I want to acknowledge from the outset before I come into some specific examples with, with climate change is that participation is not a simple nor obvious endeavor. Citizen participation with science is not a virtue in itself and I'm not arguing for that. Um, even though participation is part of our normative claims about democracy. In practice, engaging citizens in science and technology is challenging, it's time and resource consuming and it can be extraordinarily frustrating. It can also fail miserably. Uh, Careful research into what citizens can do in particular instances, the kinds of reforms that will help them, or I suppose I should say us, <laughs> as if they're opposite, separate from what we're doing, uh, but help us achieve transformations, as well as the kind of policy domains in which such actions are appropriate are increasingly necessary. Most of what we know about citizen participation is based on conventional wisdom that often paints an unrealistic picture. And I think that's where the research is really important. That's why I want to give you just an example of what this looks like and as it unfolds in practice, because every instance is different. And so it's very difficult to make, to make oh, claims. Oftentimes people want the, the toolbox of how it is that you can use these initiatives so that we can reach in, pick out a particular method as if we would a particular tool for a job. Unfortunately, it's much more complicated than that and often takes a, an awareness of context and sometimes it can change and, and, and thwart our best efforts. And again, participation for its own sake can be a mistake as, as, as its success is highly context dependent. In short, participation is a complicated, uncertain endeavor that requires skill, advanced planning, careful thought, and I would add a sense of humor. Now it's interesting that climate change has sparked many creative instances of public engagement that span the spectrum from information campaigns to activist protests. And what I have up here is a picture of, of people who have formed an hourglass, again, giving the sense of time running out or time is ticking. And this is particularly in events of the Copenhagen negotiations. So here I'm not going to actually separate science from politics. I'm going to say that the two need to be thought together and particularly when we have context and policy context that are bringing into the fore not only changes uh, that are immediate but also changes into the long term future, changes that will affect uh, our very lifestyles as well as our very uh, visions of the future. And we've seen a lot of initiatives, some of you may be familiar with these, that creative use of social media, 350.org is one, attempting to draw public awareness to 350 parts per million in the atmosphere and getting people to form base, various um, uh, representations of 350, so whether you have people coming together uh, to, to form the, the, the number and taking aerial shots of that or little children holding up 350, the number 350 or whatever. It's, it's been a really creative campaign. They've also had international days of action. One of them was October 24th uh, and uh, they've had many vigils and supported people just taking initiative uh, and then uploading what they've done in their various regions. So it's been remarkable how many people they've brought together. Interestingly enough, I teach a course in the natural sciences. I'm actually in the faculty of communication and culture, but I have a, a, a quarter appointment in the natural sciences and I asked a question, I was telling my science students about this, and I asked a question to simply what, why is the number 350 significant now? And nobody could answer that. That's what I found, I mean, we were taught, it wasn't out of context, it was in the context of climate change. So that's what I found incredibly surprising was that even within what we might call, you know, the, the sort of initiated, initiate into science, that this is not common knowledge, that this would be, you know, a, a significant number. So I think that these, in a sense, it's public information, but it's also trying to engage people in a really interesting way. We also have an organization called avaz.org, as well as Tick, 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 again, si signifying the, the, the urgency that's needed with these uh, negotiations. And there was uh, 10 million plus signatures that were collected and delivered to the negotiators, uh, again, supporting the results from the IPCC report and showing a sense of urgency. So that, that's quite a remarkable number of people that have been that have been organized. And just recently on Saturday there was a global climate campaign with a global day of action and this is just a picture of, of the, the street protests and there were um, um, estimates between, from what I've read anyway, 60 to 100,000 people. It's always really difficult to put, put an exact number on this, but the COP15 negotiations are, are said to be one of the largest activist meeting places uh, for, um, for people who are concerned about, about climate change and climate science. 
These demonstrations of citizen concern show that climate change is not only a scientific and technological issue. Now, I know we've been talking about that before, but I think that it really emphasizes that it will also not remain solely in the domain of scientific and technological expertise. Activists are attempting to reframe issues beyond questions of technological solutions into a more sustained critique of social in inequality, as well as, uh, and this is the work of journalist Naomi Klein, as well as the emergent climate justice movement, starting to talk about climate debt in terms of our, our broader scale colonial relations and what that means in terms of paying off these, these issues of resource exploitation as well as, as broad scale social inequality. Now, deliberative events offer a different approach to engaging citizens with science that unlike one-way models of science communication enable more engagement with science, and unlike traditional protests, op offer opportunities for a range of people to participate beyond those with activist inclinations. And so I want to put it within the context of activism, or more broadly within the con context of engagement, because as I said, activism is, is one, con uh, one sort of activity on the continuum. But one of the problems, I think, with activism is that it is bound up with a lot of, of what we'll call in social movement theory identity politics. And so that if you're involved with, with, with these protests, you tend to be thinking in the same way and coming from a, a similar type of, of uh, I suppose, predisposition, whether it's around issues that you identify with or your particular position on it. One of the differences with deliberative events is that it creates what we might call a public sphere. That is a space in which we can come together to discuss issues of similar concern without necessarily having the same opinion. And it's, at least in theory, very productive to have those generative debates with people that don't think like us. It expands our thinking and, and according to some, is the root of democracy. Now, I want to just turn to uh, our event, Worldwide Views on Global Warming, and, and just say a, a few things about it, and, and then I'm going to show you a short video that, that gives you a sense of what this looks like. If you haven't participated in an engagement event, sometimes it's difficult to actually have an image of what that looks like. Worldwide Views on Global Warming is historically unprecedented just because it is the first instance of public engagement on a global scale. The idea was first initiated by the Danish Board of Technology, which is the technology assessment arm of the Danish government, and it is rooted in the Danish model of consensus conferences in which a small number of randomly selective, selected citizens are gathered to discuss and debate scientific and technological issues. And the aim is to provide feedback to policy makers. We involved over 38 countries, as I mentioned before, and it was organized in, in addition to the Danish Board of Technology by a range of different groups, university, non-governmental organizations, as, as well as technology assessment institutions. So there was quite a, a, a remarkable range of people that, that were involved in this. Uh, just to give you a sense of the process, in each country, uh, people were randomly selected to participate. The, the golden number was 100, although some, some places had less than that, some, people, some places had more. Um, and by randomly selected, uh, we, just to give you a sense of what this is like, we sent out over 3,000 letters to participants. We had 98 responses, which shocked us, because here we're offering a free trip, all expenses paid, to Calgary for a weekend to talk about what we think is the most pressing issue uh, of our time, and we had such a low response rate. But having talked to people who do this type of thing on a regular basis, they said that's fantastic. So if you're ever in, in the process of doing something like this, don't, don't worry about a response rate on that level. Um, so as I said, we had 98 people. We actually had to do a little bit more recruiting in order to get our numbers up. And we had um, about 110 people when we started, but it dropped down to 103. So we felt like that was a really good sense. Generally, we tried to have this reflective of the demographics of Canada uh, because that, that was the mandate by the Danish Board of Technology. We did tweak that a little bit. Uh, so what we did was we had a sense, we, we tried to take a democratic representation from each province in Canada as well as based on gender, age, income, uh, and education levels to the degree that we could. We found that this was a very self-selecting audience. Um, and so it was really difficult to get people who were... Uh, who didn't have a university education um, and also who were what we might call at least a little bit more right-leaning on the political spectrum. So we had to do, to, to do a little bit more recruiting. We also overemphasized our Aboriginal and Inuit participants because they are obviously feeling the effects of this much more often and not having access to, um, to modes of communication that other people might. So this just gives you a sense of our participants. 
And this is also just the global scope. And it's quite remarkable to actually pull off something like this on, on a level. We started in Australia and, and moved right to California was our last um, discussion. And this uh, all, to, all took place on the same day, September 26th. So it was, it was quite remarkable to, to see the different results being uploaded. And as I mentioned, the, the context is really important because it was the COP15 negotiations that were sparking this. And, and the, dis, the, the questions that were put up for discussion were based on the questions that are, are up for negotiation at COP15 around issues of shared vision, what, what goals should we have for, for target limits as well as how to reduce our CO2 emissions, issues of mitigation, what does it mean to have common but differential responsibilities, issues around adaptation, um, technology transfer as well as finance. So there's quite a bit for, for people to talk about. And just to give you a sense of what the discussion process looked like, uh, we had sent an information brochure out to everyone. There was actually no experts per se in the room. And so our expertise was given in two forms. One was a, a background document that people had, had uh, about a month and a half to, to, to um, look at. And, and then prior to each discussion, we also had a short video just to introduce the theme and to give a little bit more information. This was then followed by a table discussion. There was then voting on set questions, and this was uploaded to a website so that you could see the, the comparison between different countries. I want to talk about that at the end because, it, it, again, there's opportunities and constraints and tensions in this and limitations, and, and, and there are a, a lot of things that worked and, and, and that, that had limits. Each table also had a trained facilitator, and I think that's just a really crucial part is that it, although it could look like something that just, just done off the cuff, it takes a lot of work to have ground rules for dialogue. And this is where we borrowed a lot from work in participatory democracy. So a train, uh, our facilitators went through extensive trainer, training. We also had note takers. And at each table, we had ground rules for dialogue. So I think that these are, are, are fairly self-evident, but just that respecting other views, giving people enough time to talk, all of that, um, and, and also listening and keeping neutrality of the, of the facilitator. Before I show you the video, and, and I just want to give, I think that the video will, will end, lend a lot to what the event was about, but I also don't want to overlook the cultural dimensions of deliberative events. And oftentimes when we think about deliberation, it's often framed in a very rational context as if we're simply computers that are processing information. And I think that there's a lot more that's going on at these events, particularly when we talk about issues of citizenship and belonging and what it means to interpret very complicated scientific information and put it into a policy context. And so we had, we also wanted to mark that issues around resource management and issues around, I suppose, management of our environmental commons are very contested culturally. So uh, we, went, we started with an opening prayer by a Blackfoot elder. And, and it was interesting, he, he did this beautiful prayer. It was very silent. We don't have any pictures because he, he didn't want to have any video. A very solemn moment. And then he made a joke about, about the French separatists in Canada, which threw everyone off. But I think it really pointed to some of the tensions that we have in a Canadian context. We also have, um, we had a keynote speaker who was a, a science journalist uh, who showed us a, a little bit about some of the transformations that are going on in the Arctic. And we had entertainment as well, um, some Inuit throat singers. We also had an exercise session involving music and dance from across Canada. So it's easy, again, to overlook this, but I think it's really important when we bring into, I think, into focus that we are very uh, complex, multifaceted people who have emotional dimensions and also cultural dimensions. Now, this is the point at which I'm going to try to do this smoothly. Oh, so far, so good. As the video plays, if you're having problems hearing it, please let me know and I'll turn up the volume. It's difficult for us because the speakers are pointing that way. looking at climate change policy issues and it was an attempt to bring citizen voices from around the world together to bear on an issue of global importance and to potentially have an influence on global decision makers. I work in the oil patch. I'm actually part of the problem. Yeah, we are starting to see things already. It's almost kind of shocking. The past two summers we've had our hottest days ever. They've broken records since we started recording weather up there in like 1947, I think. Citizen deliberation provides a lot of opportunities, 
for new ways of, of enacting change. We caused this problem. We caused it without knowing it, and now this problem is going to be one of the biggest things facing like future generations. If I say that, don't worry, it's not going to happen, 1998 was the hottest year we've had, and it's been getting cooler since 1998. The old thing, thing I'm a bit uh, disappointed with our government not taking a stronger stand on climate change. So this was a very important um, event for us because it allowed these voices to be heard for the first time. Good afternoon, I'm Edna Einzerel and I've had the tremendous privilege of working as project director with a wonderful team on this first ever Canadian consultation on climate change and it is even more important because it is the first ever global citizen engagement. Well, we were invited by the Danish board to lead the Canadian consultation. There are 103 of you citizen participants in this room. And, you've and the Danish Board of Technology, who is the organizing body, is now in the midst of, of trying to write a policy report out of those findings, which will be disseminated to COP15 attendees or the Conference of the Parties. The most important thing about the process was really thinking about how do publics deliberate about policy issues that are controversial and climate change is an example of that. So this is a very quick overview of the weekend. The idea was to have people talk about the same issues that policymakers are talking about. They were asked about what they thought the urgency of coming to a climate deal is, uh, whether they thought their country should sign on, trying to understand how to fairly distribute the burden between developed countries and, and developing countries. I want to emphasize that these are also the same issues that are being discussed by the representatives at the COP15 negotiations. Every session, thematic session, was a group of eight participants at a table with a facilitator. This will then be followed by a discussion at your table. When you're at your table, you're presented with a question, and you discuss the questions. What? are your hopes and fears about what this could mean to your community, to your children, future generations. And so we got to talk a lot. There was a lot of talking and a lot of listening as well, I guess, which is another important part. And then the voting. After the discussion, you will be asked to vote on your preferred option. And those votes were then collected at the table. And then all of the votes from the whole room were uploaded onto the Danish Board of Technologies internet site at the same time as results were coming from around the world. I think it was really almost overwhelming to be doing something that 37 other countries were doing at the same time. It really made the issue bigger, like that we all could unite at a certain period of time on a topic and regardless, it doesn't matter what it was, that we were all working together towards something. Okay, I'm going to start with the very general question. Uh, what do you associate with climate change? When I think about climate change, I think about um, our environment changing to a more extreme degree than we're going to be able to deal with. What people want isn't the problem, it's how they get to what they want is, can be a problem. Citizen deliberation has a long history. It's bound up with democracy. Citizens talking about science and technology, especially complicated issues around science and technology policy, is relatively new. Maybe the contrast is with 
public opinion polls. That's something that a lot of people are familiar with. So you get a call on the telephone, they ask you questions about an issue, you give your you know, answer. Um, answers quite often that you haven't really given much thought to. That's one picture of getting citizen views. Like I'm not talking 100 years ago, I'm talking millions of years ago. We've had some very diverse weather, weather patterns on it. So what is our impact today is, is my biggest question. But I wonder, like Walter says, yes. that's, that's natural or have we contributed to, to that? The other picture is to think about citizen deliberation as a process of learning, as a process of listening to other views, as a process of discussing and maybe even debating issues, and then coming to some conclusions, either on your own or as a consensus in terms of the group, then taking those learnings and doing something with them. To do something costs money. So the Americans have their own plan. They just haven't signed on to it. But we know what their plan is, so I don't know how you can really see that. Un élément parmi d'autres, parce que c'est évident euh, qu'on n'est pas des experts, donc c'est évident qu'on ne doit pas avoir le poids d'experts non plus dans les décisions. Par contre, c'est important de comprendre comment la population pense, où elle se situe, ce qu'elle appuie ou non, puis ce qu'elle est prête à faire aussi. Talking about politics is all part of doing politics, and it's not just high-level decision makers that are part of the conversation, it's more of a, um, a public conversation. And there's a lot of people nowadays that would say we've lost that art of being able to have those sorts of conversations in a sort of civil way and um, in a meaningful way. So these are opportunities for people to feel engaged in, in politics and to feel like they're having some sort of influence. They're part of the political process in, in some way. In my mind, like right now, at this point in time, nobody wants to curb consumption. Nowhere in the world has consumption decreased in the last, like, 10, 15 years. One of the contributions, I suppose, would be to explore and provide opportunities for how we can talk about um, complicated issues around the environment, around technical solutions, around energy futures, around issues of social justice, uh, around financial systems. There's so much bound up with climate change, it's hard to just call it a, an environmental issue. If they don't have any uh, targets, right, and we do, right, simple things going to happen is that some steel part, that thing moves, that factory moves to China and they start making it there because it's cheaper. There was this one guy from Nova Scotia and uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't think that climate change is related to human activity. But he had really, really strong environmental views, like he's a vegetarian for the environmental reasons, which like blew my mind. You just wouldn't have expected it. To promote keeping things closer to home, I think that we could maybe put some form of tax on the imported and bring a redu reduction to the local so that we start promoting local and we start using our own resources prior to abusing other people. When we were first sitting down at the tables and we went around the first time and uh, heard what other people's employment was, I was expecting us to have a lot of different views. Because governments are in for the short term. I mean, you know, their, their power is only so long. And so when you talk 2050 to them, I mean, you can throw anything out. And that's what makes it unachievable. Uh, that's where my real skepticism with any kind of a tariff or taxation or incentives is because it's economic and business driven. I don't think it's fair to say that developing countries should have to be the same as Canada because they don't have the same resources and technologies that we do. Like I was blown away with how much we all still had the same type of goal regardless of where we came from, what type of work we do, we all still had the same goals. Even those who are working in oil type jobs still are aware of the situation and still want to make good of it. You can't just take something without replacing it. Every person has Everybody seems to understand the same problems. And that's a good thing. Because they take that back to their communities.
It was so exciting when I went online last night and saw that our results were online. You were asked, is there a problem? How urgent is it? We got to today compare our votes to the rest of the world. It was interesting. It was uh, rather humbling. I, I definitely want to check it out more online to compare to specific countries rather than just the world. But uh, knowing where Canada's stand was compared to the world, we've lost some of our faith in our government, I think. And so even though we do want things to happen, we're a little skeptical of if it's really going to get done this time. I would say that maybe our next goal, and this is speaking from myself as an educator, would be to educate our politicians in what democracy means in terms of listening to citizen voices. After this, I'm really optimistic in the fact that there are people who are interested and passionate and dedicated to, to move this cause, to get it going, and I'm really optimistic that change will happen. We have to use whatever opportunity, whether it's one-on-one -on -one conversation, conversations within organizations or through political channels to make concerns known. And I think it's, it, and it's important to go from, from just a discussion grassroots level to jump it up, to bump it up to a political issue. And I think that's where it will have the greatest impact. We would like the policymakers who are at Copenhagen to hear the views of these citizens. But there is an equally important initiative to get other publics to hear what their fellow citizens are saying. I think the biggest difference this will make is that uh, people will talk. Like every single person at this conference, I think, um, was, I, I think was energized. Like you could kind of feel it, like in the sessions and people talking. People are very passionate about this issue. And even just getting that dialogue out there is a way of educating people about the issue. I think if anything to take out of this event, I hope that people can get a um, broader understanding of the many ways that citizen participation can influence the broader society um, as well as just politics. And things like that, but I, I wasn't really, I wasn't an activist in any way, but I think I'm becoming an activist as a result of this conference. So that's huge. Je crois beaucoup aussi moi à l'impact de, de la simple conversation de dire que qu'on est 100 citoyens ici qui ont été beaucoup plus sensibilisés, qui vont retourner chez eux, qui vont en parler à d'autres personnes autour d'eux. Et ça aussi, ça fait bouger les choses, même si c'est informel. We're thinking about doing a presentation of the school with pictures of what we did and letting them know what happened and this is a really big thing that yeah. we were involved in. And letting them know that they can like be involved in these things and they they can be heard if they actually like participate in things like this. I do plan on contacting local newspaper and uh, getting them to interview myself and the students I came with about this event and uh, what our goals are. What individuals do can and does matter. Always, always. And that's something that I think maybe we lose sight of sometimes in society, but your choices do matter. They do have an impact. I think that all people should listen to us when we come back to our communities and listen to them because it is the big picture. Your children, my daughter's children, are going to grow up in this world. And what kind of world are they going to grow up in? We all, as human beings, have to come together, all races, you have to understand this is our earth and it supports us and we have to learn to support it. So I'm just going to um, run the, the final credits with just to give you a sense of the people who participated. But I, I promised at the start that I would uh, bring this into, into your own context, particularly how this is 
relevant for climate scientists and for those of you interested in communicating science, I think the second might find this a little bit more obvious. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting because what, what we did intentionally was exclude experts from this process. So you may wonder why am I talking to you about this. But I think that it has really important implications in terms of various and innovative ways in which we might think about communicating science. Um, and, and also what it means to communicate in different venues. One of the things that we found from this exercise was that there was a great deal of social learning that happened. And I was quite shocked at how little our, our participants knew about climate science when they first came in. And so even though our initial um, background document, I think, gave a, a fairly a general overview of climate science. We didn't get into a lot of the complexities. People still at that level didn't really know a lot about it. And that's something that we've gotten a lot of criticism for. And I'm actually very open to criticism, so I, I, I look forward to, to hearing your comments at the end of this. But, um, but I think one thing that we, we got repeatedly was what value is it to have non-experts talking about highly technological issues, particularly if they don't know very much about the climate science. And I think that, that that's something that brings us back again to that tension between a liberal democracy and between the technical society in which we live. We could forego our democracy, but that is a context uh, that is quite significant. Um, I also want to address some of the the learning that, that happened for us and also some of the, the things that we struggle with as a result of putting this on. Again, there, it's very easy to come into um, normative conversations about the need for more engagement. It's different to actually do it. And I think that that's where putting the theory in relation to the practice is really important because oftentimes a, a lot of the work that I see will end on that note of we need to engage people more centrally. We need to get beyond this focus on the media um, and to actually get our information a little bit more I in terms of int intimate engagements. And yet doing that raises different types of questions that are, that are quite significant. So I want to end with just to talk about some theoretical and practical implications of public engagement initiatives. There are implications for multi-level governance. And although this was framed in the context of getting uh, information to our chief negotiators, I think that there's many levels of governance. And we're also seeing a shift, by governance I mean a shift from government to empowering a range of people uh, and particularly as we see the, the, the uh, decline of the state at a nation state level in terms of their power, this again with, with our moves towards privatization and, um, and also deregulation that we're seeing a range of actors stepping in to fill that role. And that's something that I think is, 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 is important to take note of so that governance is increasingly being pushed on to different groups that are not necessarily state actors. But also when we talk about governance, we might want to think about those power dynamics between experts and again that category called non-experts. What do we stand to learn from people who do not have expertise in our area? And I think that it addresses a very deep um, tendency to assume that experts are the ones who are going to lead the way in terms of policy. And I think that that's a, a very dominant tendency. So that's being shifted and sometimes forced, sometimes in, in ways that's <laughs> productive and sometimes in ways that isn't. There's also some questions around the politics of inclusion, exclusion, and representation that I think are quite important, and I just want to touch on these. One of the ways in which um, this, this became also a conversation initiative in its own right is that the reports or the results were communicated not simply in a policy report, and I have a copy of the policy report if you're interested, but those tend to, to remain on a shelf and don't have very much circulation. What the Danish board did was brought this together into a website so you could actually compare the results from different countries. And I just want to give you an example of what that looks like. You can go onto the website and select a country, compare it to another country, or you can select a group of countries and compare them with a group of other countries. And then you can also select one of the questions. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want to give you a sense of what that looks like so that this has a, serves as a communication model in and of itself. Now, one of the things that happened is that the complex and, and very interesting dialogues got reduced into multiple choice type questions in which people did the vote. And that, that it served almost a double role. One was public deliberation, which is unruly. As you know, um, we were joking that, that we, we try to frame this in terms of a very rational process. It's much more like a family dinner <laughs> in terms of the range of different uh, perspectives and, and problems that come out. But 
but, but the communication is definitely looks a lot like a public opinion survey. And so we're seeing that, that in terms of what percentage of the, of the, the citizens who participated, what, what were their opinions. And this is done because it's important for policymakers to communicate this in a very simple way, but also to, to generate some interest in the project. So I want to say that it's not representative in a social science sense because we didn't have large enough numbers. So, and that's easy to assume when you look at these types of, of, of data. But I think that it's interesting to look at comparisons across countries. We start to see a sense of urgency. Most people were, were, were very concerned and had, and had a sense that this was a really urgent issue, which supports, I think, that, that uh, a lot of the, the work that both Max and Matt were saying, that even though at a media level we're seeing deniers come out, that, that at the level of, of uh, I suppose people's concerns, we do have a great deal of concern over this. Um, and also a sense of, of, of joining a climate deal based on the science. And this is something that's interesting in terms of how little uh, people knew that according to um, at least self-reported, and I think that's important because we didn't actually double check in, in terms of what people actually knew. This is just how much they reported they knew. But that there is a, a sense in the United States at least that people knew a lot more than people in Canada about climate change. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe we're just more humble. I have no idea. <laughs> um, and these issues around concern are, are, are significant as well um, in terms of are people very concerned, fairly concerned, or slightly concerned. In Canada, we had uh, quite a, I think, a low number compared to the rest of the world in terms of levels of, of concern, although if we took the, the very concerned and the fairly concerned together, they, they turn out to be quite similar. The not concerned or slightly concerned are quite low, and this was this bared out across um, all of the results. This is quite interesting in terms of the comparison with Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 countries, and I think this is where uh, getting into a lot more of the detailed discussions is really important, is that the fairly concerned in Annex 1 countries was 46% compared to 80% of concern in non-Annex 1 countries. And if you're not familiar with that terminology, um, Annex 1 countries can be loosely interpreted in terms of developed or industrial nations, whereas non-Annex countries are developed, uh, developing countries. And, and that, I think, bears examination with uh, in terms of the countries that are doing the most to promote uh, climate, greenhouse gas emissions, and those who are dealing with the consequences. So I think that these are, are really bearing out in, in much more vulnerable populations. So you could go onto our website and if you're interested in, in these types of statistics. <laughs> and it's really quite fun to play with. But uh, in terms of the actual uh, delivery, uh, we really struggled with issues of in inclusion and cultural difference in terms of both acknowledging issues of difference but not reifying them. And we, we didn't know what to do in a sense with our Aboriginal participants if we should just segregate um, in terms of, of, of paying attention to conversations that might come up because of power imbalances or, or treat everyone as if they're the same. And in order to solve our problem, we asked people what they wanted to do. And so it turned out that we had seven people who strongly thought that they should stay together, and the other three said that they wanted to, to remain with the other group. So it worked out because we had seven people at each table. <laughs> Interestingly enough, and, and we're not resolved on this in terms of if we did the right, I don't think there is a right thing. There's, there's decisions that we make and we, we suffer the, or bear the consequences. But the discussions that we, we found at the Aboriginal, uh, and this included Inuit Aboriginal Métis people, that their discussions focused a lot more on food issues and hunting and those, and those issues around water, whereas we didn't see that with our other tables. It was much more what are future generations going to do, what are our energy implications, what are our tax implications. So that that real presence of food, I think, is quite significant and, and comes into issues of reframing. Our biggest problem, I think, was how to respond to orchestrated climate denial campaigns. And I, I love this one. It was a recent uh, conference in New York where we had the hurrah global warming. <laughs> Let's celebrate the effects of global warming. Because when we uphold those values of liberal democracy, we have to give an equal voice to everybody. And um, there is, I think, a, a lot of naivete that comes into these particular processes without looking at the ways in which media are structured. And so uh, we had one person, we had very few deniers in the group, but we did have two people and one was very vocal. He brought his own binder of scientific facts to, to counter the, the information that we had provided. So, um, and, he, and, and we provided space on our website as well, and he was the one that was the most vocal in terms of, if you read our comments, he's always got a comment about how climate change isn't happening. We we'd included his voice in the, in the documentary, if you caught those little bits, just because we wanted to show that there, there is a lot of tension. But it is difficult, and I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. 
in terms of making sense of how to deal with these orchestrated campaigns. So to conclude, just to say that public engagement is not a panacea. I'm not saying that this is going to be the, the solution to solve every problem. It's a potential avenue for improving science and society relations. And it is part of a broader contextual shift, whether we like it or not, towards democratizing science and technology. And this is bound up with this broader politicization of science that I think is unavoidable. It, there's certain requirements that I think are really important. One is scientific literacy, as, and that just being, as I, I defined it before, the understanding of basic scientific concepts and methods, as well as civic literacy. And, and I think by civic literacy, just a real appreciation for what it means to live in a, in a democratic context. And this is on the part of all participants, and I would even include uh, people who are watching the, the documentary itself and talking about engagement activities as part of participants because it's making sense of what these mean and what these could mean for us. And this involves a reflexivity, humility, and a willingness to learn. And we're seeing a broader cultural shift again towards understanding the potential and limitations of participatory democracy. I think that although the problems are definitely there, the rewards are substantial, particularly in the realm of climate change. And I, and I think the perspectives of scientists are very important. Climate change is, and again I'll emphasize this, much more than a scientific and environmental issue. It's humanitarian, cultural, and ethical, and it requires a range of insights, debates, and solutions. Science is not the only source of, in, of evidence, and this is a point that's sorely missed by the climate denier movement. The testimonies and struggles of those communities experiencing the immediate effects of climate change are equally important for our collective knowledge. Taking into consideration a range of values, perspectives, experience of non-experts enriches our understanding of the opportunities and constraints that we are currently facing in forging the conditions for a more environmentally sustainable and socially just future. So I'll, I'll end it there. I also want to say, do, do the, the, the thank you to our sponsors and say that we do get sponsored from an oil and gas company and we have been accused of being everything from white right wing conspiracy group that we're <laughs> to left wing uh, environmental nuts. So it's, it's nice to, I think if you get that range of critique, it means you're doing something right. <laughs>good amount of time for question and answer. Just quick, uh, show of hands, how many people have heard of these types of public engagement exercises before, are familiar with them? Okay. Uh, two points. One is that I have a concern that there's a the fallacy that's not necessarily being presented here, but you see it a lot in the press, that the, the whole global warming issue can be resolved by public polls. And you rely a lot on public polls to see, to analyze how people are thinking about that. And that's fine and good. But even on reputable, uh, uh, you know, talk shows, you know, national public radio and things like that, there seems to be a, a huge emphasis on, well, the polls are saying this. Well, okay, in the 1970s, there were polls in China and, and said that the, the Chinese didn't believe that the man had walked on the moon in the 1960s. Uh, it didn't change the fact changes none of the facts. It's just sort of our proper perception and it is an indication of how well or well not our public is educated. Um, what I'd like to get back to is this whole issue of um, framing uncertainty, uh, which is also comes up here is, is, is that, that by sort of hashing things out. Uh, one of the issues, is, I think this is one of the most important issues uh, in climate change discussions is how we frame uncertainty and how we define it in the technical community versus in sort of the, the, the common press. Um, you have this idea of sort of error bars or uncertainty and to the general public when you say uncertainty that the question is well is it true or is it not? And the error bars are simply to a, a person who isn't scientifically literate an error bar means well what fraction of your data is wrong. That's the way it sort of comes across. Uh, my suggestion that I've been trying to push to a lot of people is that people talk more in terms of confidence limits. And confidence limits are a way of talking about the statistical confidence you have that your error is within a certain limit. And that's perfectly valid. It means the same thing as an error bar. But it doesn't come across with that same connotation. Um, and because the science and the, and the non-scientific community talk about it very differently. When I was teaching chemistry, you know, a student turns in a lab report and they say the answer is 10. And, well, is that right? Or, well, it's wrong because it's 10 plus or minus what? 10.0 plus or minus 0.02. Okay, that's a good answer. That tells me that I know that you know that to within a certain error bar or confidence limit. But, uh, a lot of people nowadays will, you know, they want the answer. 
And one of the problems is that the, the right is, is, is pushing this notion that you know, we should be discussing uh, uncertainty all the time. And it's true, but then the discussion goes back and forth in a different way. The, the left seems to be more confident, uh, or at least more comfortable in this idea of living in a world with uncertainties. You make decisions, you have to make some decisions, you don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you, you know, you've got to decide something. The right seems to be much more black and white in its general world view, and so this idea of uncertainties means that, well, if you don't know, well, then just don't decide anything and just put, put the brakes on. And that, I think, comes up within the context of this whole notion of, of uncertainty. Um, and part of the problem is that I think a lot of scientists are not very comfortable with the notion of uncertainties, too. Uh, you take a look at a lot of the assessment reports, and, and, and I'll be very critical. I'm a scientist myself. Um, I come out of the, the measurement community, you put up things on balloons and whatnot. You have to have a plus or minus at the end of each number, and if you don't, the answer is wrong. And we're very careful about that. You talk to our colleagues who are in the satellite community, and I served as two years as a chief scientist for one of the NASA data centers. You talk to the satellite community, and you say, well, the answer is, you know, 27. Plus or minus what? And they give you a blank stare. Well, because there are lots of things that go into these very complicated derived units. It may not be a primary observation the way that you put, you know, a, a pH meter into a beaker of water or something. It's a derived unit, and coming up with a good estimate of the uncertainty associated with that is a very difficult thing to do. And then you have all these derived units being propagated into other derived units, and you have questions like, well, are we going to have more anthrax? Are we going to have more, uh, you know, certain diseases, dengue fever? Well, that depends upon, well, how is the, the humidity changing? How is the temperature changing? Each of these has error estimates associated with it. And then you try to come up with an, an estimate on the total process and our propagation of errors is what is the technical term for it. Uh, scientists in multidisciplinary efforts, and climate is one of them because you have lots of different communities, hasn't always been very good at communicating this notion of propagating errors into the final question. And there are two ways you can talk about this. One is looking back at historical data sets, and you would think that would be a done deal. Okay, we know temperatures are changing, we have data records, blah, blah, blah. Even with a hockey stick, the whole idea of error bars associated with a hockey stick came up, and that became a big public issue. It's more of a public issue when you're talking about um, projecting into the future and estimating what are the errors associated with what might happen in the future with climate. And then the question of error bars becomes very, very open-ended. So I think, I mean, those are, um, there's um, a, a lot to your, uh, to your comment. I think some, some very excellent uh, observations. I'll just have a quick reaction and then sure. I'll hand it off. Um, I, mean, I think at it, it, it one level, um, uh, today's discussion uh, on the panel is really looking at um, a, a kind of a, a level of, of, of focus on some of these scientific questions um, in both popular culture and then also kind of mainstream news media presentations where um, often some of these more uh, detailed uh, focus on the communication of, of, of some of these detailed specifics of the science is never gotten to. Um, and um, there, is, there is research in, in risk communication and also in uh, educational psychology on, in, for example, uh, in, in designing and presenting graphical information in, in the next IPCC report, you know, the, the, the in-depth evaluation of, of that graphical display for understandability, um, and then also obviously in, in, in developing curriculum and, and things like that. So I think that's one, one area. But I think the second part of that is the, the, the point that you raise is that, you know, the debate over uncertainty is almost infinite. It can be almost infinite. And as, as long as uh, advocates often misconstrue the climate change policy debate as simply a matter of science, that the science compels action and or kind of implicitly that the science compels action on a specific policy such as uh, cap and trade or, or whatever treaty is, is eventually negotiated, as long as that happens, you're always going to create the incentive for the other side to yep. argue against that policy by infinite manufacture of uncertainty. There will always and be scientific right. uncertainty so that, associated with any of these things. Right. So that, that, that what has to happen is, is more is open, transparent discussion about the values involved in terms of 
why, why we want to support policy action in the face of uncertainty. So it could be a moral question, it could be a religious question, it could be the value of, of human health and well-being and public health. It could be an economic question, right? But I'll, I'll, just, I'll just hand it off to the other panels if you want to mention them. Well, I, I think as a, I, I think in terms of the moment that we are, we don't deal with uncertainty very well. And I want to take Jerome Rabbit's definition of uncertainty as a form of knowledge and a form of knowledge that is about recognizing what we don't know, which is really difficult. I mean, it's what we don't know that we don't know that's going to hurt us, isn't it? Uh, and, but at least being aware, I think, of, of that paradox makes us much more humble and open to listening to other perspectives. And it may well be within climate change. And I think when we talk about issues of, of who has the authority to speak for what climate change will mean, who has the authority to speak for what solutions are going to draw, or are, are, are the most you know, uh, so, socially important uh, as well as environmentally sound, um, I think that we, we don't ask that question enough. And, and it may well be that we focus on you know, the is or isn't this a problem and the solutions, but maybe we don't even know what the problem is. And, and that, that might open us up into thinking about this in a different way. And that might sound like an odd thing to say that we don't know what the problem is. But, but I'm just thinking about some of the discussions that happened at COP15, and there was such a rich range of discussions about maybe our focus shouldn't be on simply technological solutions to, to, to change our carbon dioxide, but maybe we should start thinking about our economic systems more broadly. Maybe our problem is, I'm not saying that, I, that these are necessarily true, but maybe our problems are, are, are with our, cap, our particular capitalist system. Maybe our problems are, are with you know, this post-colonial moment in which we're, we're continuing to, 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 to keep these inequalities in place. Now, oftentimes, scientists don't feel that they are, are, have the authority to speak on those realms, but I think that we need to blur those boundaries and really start thinking about the complex ways in which we, the environment is not simply nature removed from culture as we know, but oftentimes we foreclose our knowledge in terms of, of making sense of that. Uh, John Van Leer uh, from Miami. Um, I think the public is just absolutely hungry to get some real uh, information on climate change. They're so sick of getting these little sound bites and they have no idea how to interpret these things. And so the um, Al Wanless, who's in the uh, chair of geology at, at UM, uh, essentially gives a, a talk which has been expanding. And the first uh, time he gave it, it was like about 40 minutes long. And there were a bunch of skeptical people in the audience who hooted and hollered. However, as time has gone on, uh, those, the hooters and hollers have essentially fallen away, and the people have this, oh my God, this is really happening about sea level rise. And the, the uncertainty in the sea level rise is a whole lot less than a lot of other issues with respect to climate change. And so rather than hammer on the things where there's big uncertainties, uh, instead, we've chosen to hammer on the thing where the uncertainty is minimum. And Hal gives this talk. I give it probably every two weeks to chambers of commerce, uh, people like that. So they have some idea, you know, what's coming because it's a, it's a really big deal. And, and, of course, it's not just South Florida, although we are arguably the most vulnerable. Uh, I mean, I live on a, wa on a waterfront canal, and the water comes up through the drains on the spring high tides. And that's not a, a very theoretical thing. That's very direct. You, know, you have to wait for the low tide to drive into work. So you know, we have a very different view of what's going on than some other places. And I think it's a much easier one to sell. And I think it's one of the things that had gotten Mayor Bloomberg uh, fired up about his climate change initiative, because New York is actually uh, vulnerable right. in quite a number of ways to let me, add, let me ask uh, Gwendolyn. Um, you know, you're you're very involved at the at the local level in, in speaking yeah. to groups, and and I'm just wondering how uh, universities and uh, can become more involved at the local level and, and other organizations. How much did your um, your public consultation event? What was the budget for? What what did it cost to do something like this? These are, are really expensive events to, to hold, and I think that's one of the limitations. It, it cost us over three hundred thousand. 
Canadian dollars. Um, and and I, we haven't actually done the comparison in terms of what a public opinion survey would cost, uh, but I think that, that that is a significant sum of money. It actually was uh, led to a lot of partners dropping off, so we could have had more countries involved. Obviously, th that expense wasn't um, it wasn't that high in other countries where, where, where you have less transportation costs. That's mostly where our money went. Um, but it, these are really costly events, and I think that that local dimension is really important. Oh. Um, and, and also engaging people locally. That's one of our aims is to get people really fired up about this and doing their own work locally. We, and we wanted to, we just actually had our documentary finished, and we wanted to get our report out and actually go to COP15. There was a symbolic moment where I got to hand the report over to our chief negotiator. Not that it makes a difference because their position's already set, but I think symbolically that matters. So mm -hmm. now we, our next stage is to see what was the learning learning involved and, and learning in terms of that interplay between scientific and, and civic literacy because I think that, that here there's a term called the ground truthers that I think we not, need to start paying more attention to and these are people that yeah. are seeing these, these impacts of climate change and how do we bring those voices into yeah. the discussion. This is very much ground truth, uh, very much down to earth, hmm. very much non-theoretical and it, it takes uh, gravity data over the ice sheet, it takes, uh, it takes uh, uh, radar altimetry data over the ice sheet. So we know what the, the integral is of the change. You know, it's accelerating the melt at 5% a year. I mean, that's serious as a heart attack. I mean, it's like compound interest. You don't have to make any better argument than that, I don't think, mm -hmm. especially in, in coastal Florida. You know, on, on this issue of cost and, 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 you know, finding money that might lead to kind of local community engagement and also innovation, in innovative uh, processes like this. Uh, let me pose a, a question to the, the people in, in the audience, then we'll move to your question. Um, you know, one idea that's been proposed is that uh, the, uh, the money that's budgeted or that has to be spent on um, public impacts related to a research grant that come through different agencies such as NSF, that at the university level, uh, the money at a research university, the, the money be pooled at the university level where uh, a committee of, of, of experts in science, communication, public engagement, and then uh, stakeholders from the local community, like the public media organization, uh, someone from the faith-based community, someone from the local school district, they then use that money to programmatically invest in local level uh, engagement initiatives. It could be a series of public forums like this. It could be subsidizing the ability of the public media station to work a, a kind of a in, a, in a, in terms of a digital news portal on, on local level information about climate change, about energy, about sustainability, where there's a participatory media element to that, where citizens are contributing their own views. Um, what do members of the audience think about the, the idea that uh, money could be pooled somehow at the local university level from that systematically, systematic investment of that public in, uh, impacts money? Let me, let me see if there's someone else. Okay, so, so something like at the... So these people yeah. are investing public money mm -hmm. in it, so it has a real public... Right. So in, the, in like the Bay Area, you have a number of research universities that might do earth science-related, environmental science-related research. And there's a number of institutional partners, like public media, science museums, science centers. What do other people think about this idea? Or, yeah. I think it's ridiculous to have the researchers doing the outreach for the most mm -hmm. part. A anyone else, sir? I think that there's uh, much more credibility, though, if the scientists are doing the outreach. I mean, because people are saying, like, oh, yeah, we need another Carl Sagan. I'm not sure I totally agree with that. Uh, but on the other hand, if you just if you have Al Gore doing your speaking, I mean, we know there's a problem with that, too. Sure. So, yeah, the idea would be that the, uh, the environmental scientists or the scientists would be working with uh, social scientists, the university, uh, uh, communication professionals, uh, local media organizations like public media, uh, the local school district, and kind of co coordinated programmatic initiatives that are kind of state-of-the-art and also have a strong evaluative piece. 
So yeah, we'd be creating, creating innovation and new knowledge about, about these types of initiatives that, that Gwendolyn. Uh, it certainly seems like a good goal. I don't know how realistic it is. Um, it, it's not obvious who should be doing this work. And uh, I think those of us in the room are, are really looking for new institutions. Um, the, the, the problem is exactly what the gentleman in the front said, is, is there's really no motivation for a scientist to do this work. In fact, there's a negative motivation. You can just get into trouble. You don't, you don't actually get any benefits for this. You put it on your resume, but actually the institutions don't like it when, when scientists participate on the debate on either side. It just, it just causes trouble, raises sparks, doesn't do anything for your career in the conventional scientific sense. But meanwhile, we're all frustrated that, that you know, no offense, journalists and social scientists are conveying messages that aren't quite on target. So there really needs to be someone with, a, with an overlap of the interests who is, who's somewhere in this loop. And um, the, the, uh, the professional track doesn't seem to exist for that. But I see a lot of interest in developing it. I just, I, I, I don't know how it's gonna come together, but that really seems to be the issue is that there isn't a proper role for uh, outreach professional who actually is both a scientist and a communication expert? Yeah, I think there are there are new degree programs that are that are emerging around that. I think it's it's both the specialization, but it also comes with the resources to do that outreach. And that's why I was suggesting that the money being pooled at the university level. And you had a comment. Yes, um, I don't know about other states, and Oregon is a rather small state in population compared to the rest of the U.S. Um, but the uh, governor of Oregon has initiated a, a global climate change initiative, and uh, that involved hiring a climate scientist to be the head of an institute that is based at Oregon State University, but is unifying both state agencies and the state universities in a kind of collective uh, research and public outreach effort and a major task of the head of this effort is to go throughout the state and explain to chambers of commerce and city groups and King um, Kiwanis clubs and other civic organizations what climate change means for Oregon and um, because so much of Oregon's economy has in the past depended on natural resources, fisheries, forestries, et cetera. Uh, the, the economic impacts of changes in rainfall, changes in ocean currents, developments of dead zones off the coast have already been felt. And so there is more of a public awareness because uh, for example, we've had to close our fisheries for the past couple of years because of the dead zones, the oxygen-deprived zones where fish just simply don't exist anymore. And, and I think this is a good model because on the local level, there is an expert who is available to talk to people, but there are also research initiatives in a collective way that reinforce what the expert is doing with his public communication. And I think it's a good model. I don't know if it would work in a very populous state. Oregon only has three million people, and you know there's twice that many in the New York metropolitan area. So I don't know how that would uh, transfer into another state situation. But it's been going for about a year in Oregon, and it has been working really, really well. So Someone had his hand up in the back there. Um, and just on Oregon, I would say that the one thing we haven't mentioned in this discussion, and, and that would also play a role in public forums, is the role of the humanities in the arts. Uh, you know, most of our, our human expression, most of our societal expression comes through the arts, comes through literature, poetry, uh, artistic expression, and collaborations between scientists, social scientists, and members of the arts professions and the humanities, I think, is really important to increasing public engagement. But you, you had your hand up in the back. Yep. Oh, no? Okay. wondering if your public information office at the university could get a grant to help their science departments 
um, communicate to a broader audience than just the press, which I'm assuming is what they normally do. Um, if that would take some of the burden off the scientist to have a, an assistant. I know you said to pool it and have all the different people involved, but would it work better to have it just go right through the public information office? And Max can and talk about this, but I think you know, public information offices are, are very good at producing news releases and uh, uh, creating coverage around single studies. And, and part of the problem that we have often is that you know, what's newsworthy in science is, is defined as what's coming out in, in, a, in a single study. And, and I, would I guess say that I meant the, you would hire somebody who was a broader specialist right, right. that would. You need a public engagement specialist. And I'm right, not sure where you would put right. that at the university level. And that's why I was suggesting this new type of, new type of committee. But you want to maybe give Max? Or? I, I, <clears throat> on that particular point, I'm not sure I have a lot to add. There were, there, in series where I am located, though, I'm learning more about, there is an outreach coordination team, which is, I've found to be an effective model. Two of them were here, and they just left maybe 10 minutes ago. But, but um, it is one way. I mean, we're all, we're all busy people. I, I, I share some of the frustrations in terms of some of this feeling like it becomes spin as to what's, you know, palatable for the public at certain periods of time. What's important to me through the interdisciplinary training that I've had is to tether this to the climate science. And so finding people that are competent in these areas to provide those bridges is incredibly important. Um, I, I just, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I share some of the skepticism. Bob Brule, I remember one of his quotes from Drexel University talking about spinning our way to sustainability. And it can be, you know, we can all ourselves feel quite, um, you know, quite discouraged that it's just a lot to ask of scientists. But I, I also don't mind saying that uh, that's the world we live in as well, and that we have to step it up as scientists. That whether we like it or not, we can retreat to our, to our uh, laboratories, to our offices, to our classrooms. But in so doing, that provides space for these, uh, for the manipulation, for other actors to step in and set the agenda. So, um, you know, there are models that we can look to, and, and from what I, I'm new at the University of Colorado, so from what I've learned so far, this, this outreach uh, group within Ceres, which I'm a part, has been effective yet. You know, this is, this is all part of the negotiation at an individual level in terms of acknowledging what our commitments are and at an institutional level in terms of providing those support systems. I'd like to just add to that quickly um, because there has been a lot of initiatives and I'm more familiar with the Canadian context than, than the U.S. context, but initiatives by granting organizations to, to provide opportunities for researchers to come into the community through, and it's just particularly the Cafe Scientific movement, so you take an, 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 an evening, go to a pub, talk about your research, and I think it's really interesting in terms of shifting that context because you're, you're forced in a sense to, to drop specialized language, to, to, to talk in a more conversational tone, but also to see who, I think a lot of the different stakeholders are, so that it, it in, in a sense, implicitly brings in, 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 in an engagement model, even though it is in some ways a one-way flow. So I think that granting agencies can play a really significant role in creating these spaces. It's part of, a, part of a broader conceptual shift in institutional change. I mean, we can say things won't change, but part of change is changing our minds and, and ideas as well. And let me just say, uh, and I think I, I understand why there would be frustration in that in terms of having um, time pressures and not understanding what you can potentially do with, with your time uh, limitations in terms of you know, broader public communication and public engagement. But I think many of these, many of these initiatives and many of these points are really the responsibility of, of the major science organizations and for universities and other groups to take up to help uh, environmental scientists uh, to create the time, to create the incentives, and to create the training. Uh, to participate in some of these things. And not every environmental scientist will want to do it. They won't have the time, they won't have the inclination, they won't have the skill level to do it. Others will, and there'll be a division of labor at some level, uh, maybe probably among tenured faculty. Um, but it's also this, this idea of, of creating new specialists that are at this intersection of science policy and, and engagement. And of course, the, the major challenge there is is around funding. And we, I think we're, we're at a crossroads in terms of, I think you've identified some of the issues that have been well known and well documented about trying to communicate, trying to inform a democracy about issues that affect policy decisions through the mass media. 
and, and, and where that model breaks down. And, and, and this session has been invaluable, I think, in, in pointing to what the limitations are. And I say that as the member of a public information office that issues news releases, that I do think that we've relied on, basically we're still manufacturing buggy whips, and the internal combustion engine has been tooling down the road for many years now, and we're trying to figure out how to put out more buggy whips. So sitting and listening, what occurs to me is that there is a model coming from the universities, which is the extension service. Mm -hmm. That the extension service has traditionally participated in some knowledge transfer, some technological transfer, um, certainly in agriculture from land-grant universities. Uh, there are other instances of that. That this idea of engaging your local community that that is one model. The other model is these outreach professionals. Um, they've traditionally been tasked with preparing an exhibit, working with a local museum, um, creating tools for teachers, whether it's K through 12 or undergrads or grads. Uh, there are very few institutions that are able to sustain uh, the professional staff that's needed for that. And I do think it is a challenge for NSF, DOE, NASA, et cetera, where will the funding for th these new paradigms come from? And I would just say in the example of the Danish Technology Board, I mean, it, it actually begs the question, do we, we, do we need a new type of institution that is, is independent, has its own source of funding that takes up the responsibility that otherwise is taken by the science organizations and the universities? Because in many cases, it, you know, on, on climate change, but especially in other areas like nanotechnology, biotechnology, there's an inherent conflict of interest when it's the science organization or it's the university that's, that's, engage, that's responsible in funding the public engagement. And, and maybe you can just maybe speak a little bit about the National Technology Board in terms of... Well, this is one thing that we found a lot of struggles with and, and also differences with other countries is that there are much stronger policy links and also links with among policymakers and scientists, in, 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 particularly in European countries. And, and I think in Canada and the U.S., we really have some very impoverished notions about what participatory democracy looks like. And I would say that you're much better in the United States than we are in Canada. Um, but we see that at an institutional level, this just there, there isn't a support system. So when, so when these, ha these events happen, they're one-off. Uh, they tend to get forgotten, and there isn't mo a momentum for change. So I think that, that if we can look to some of the models that are happening, particularly within Europe, I think that we can start to see the opportunities for change to, to, to make this much more sustained and institutional. I think you're spot on. You have a question? Yeah. Um, I was um, wondering whether you guys were actually aware that HU had launched a uh, science responding to journalist question initiative for the Copenhagen conference where they staffed scientists uh, for 24-7 for those two weeks. And it, I think it was a good start and it was uh, the first kind of this model where everybody could sit in their jammies at home and just uh, log into a common website and everybody could then answer questions. However, after several days they already cut the stuff, because the staff or the scientists so to speak, because not as many inquiries came. So the question is one, did they not advertise it enough, or B, they, people are not really interested in the science, actually. And that goes also back to my own experience. I'm teaching in an urban university, and the students are scared of nature, so how do I even reach them? Yeah. So they are not interested in science, really. They are scared of science. When I ask any sort of math question, they freak out, and urban environments getting them because it's all environment and nature. So I'm wondering. I mean, there's a good model that the AGU started, but how to reach? Max, do you have something? I guess I would just say that, that I hadn't heard of it. So I guess it would be A in that case. But, but um, I, I would be inclined to say that it's not that people aren't interested in the science. I think it's um, just making it, uh, communicating that that access was available. That would be my response. Matthew, I had a question. Could you actually sort of like um, specify what you mean by having like a, a separate group that's doing the science outreach? Because um, you've said you kind of have a, a, a vague description, but do you have a specific idea in mind? Well, I mean, the, the, the point was raised here is that, you know, traditionally it's, it's the PI's responsibility to, to figure out how to spend that money and what, what to do, how to do it effectively and, and whether it has, figure out whether it has any impact. We don't, we don't know uh, eventually. Um, and so the idea would be to, um, help the PI 
uh, be more effective in, uh, and actually relieve some of the burden and some of the specialization that's needed by, uh, and, and people hate human subject sports. I don't know if this is a good analogy, but you have a, a committee at the university level that has scientists, social scientists, experts in education, and stakeholders from the community and experts from the community who the money is pooled and then each, each semester or each year they're thinking programmatically and systematically about how can they invest in the overall kind of communication and engagement infrastructure for the community surrounding the university. It could be programmatic initiatives and investments in, uh, in, in, in education in the public schools. It could be subsidizing the ability of the local public media station, which is often affiliated with the university, to do a better job of covering energy, sustainability, and climate in the area. It could be partnerships with the city. It could be partnerships with uh, not-for-profits, such as uh, the local diocese or a church network, for example. Um, and in the process, then you have people who are experts in, uh, in science and in education and in communication and are professionals at producing really high-quality things like websites um, with the resources they need to have an impact at the local level. And it, it creates jobs, too. It's, it's an engine for, uh, for job growth, and, and it, it benefits the overall community. Right, yeah, I, I think it's a really good idea in principle. Um, I guess my concern is if you have, like, a group that's sort of independent from the, the scientists, you end up with something that's very similar to a, a public affairs office. Mm -hmm. um, I work for NASA, and there's actually a great deal of friction between a lot of the scientists and the public affairs office because PAO maybe glosses over uncertainty. Um, they do a lot of other things that sort of don't accurately reflect the science in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know, one, um, of the, one, of, one of the things is that there's been the argument that scientists don't need to know about the issues that were presented today. Some people have made that argument very loudly. A fellow PIO, uh, Earl Holland, has made that argument. Um, but you know, this speaks to the, the, the idea that because scientists are often the major policy setters and decision makers at institutions like universities or government agencies, uh, the more that they're aware of the research in this area and the implications, um, the more that they can uh, uh, participate and think about long-term investment in these types of, of innovations that you know, I would argue are, 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 are needed. Many people agree are needed. So the, the scientists sitting, the scientists would be part of the overall committee and they would be appreciative, they would be sensitive to, they would be aware of many of the issues that we talked about today and they would be actively participating with the other members of that committee in making long-term programmatic decisions. I yeah, think, I'd, I'd, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make a, a comment too is that um, I think there's a, a, an importance to come back to that question of, of the difference between the, the traditional model of communication and also this, this broader uh, model of engagement because even the, the examples that we've been using here are based on that one-way flow of information. How do we get this accurate information to the public? And I think that, that these organizations that look at engagement, um, and, and I'm not saying it's easy and I know that we're pressed for time and all of this, but I think that theoretically at least the impulse is to look at what does it mean when we engage with a variety, and maybe I won't say experts versus non-experts, but a variety of different expertise. And what does that mean as scientists? And I want to include you know, I think that we, we tend to d exclude social scientists and, 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 and people in the humanities, but let's say researchers in general. What does it mean to, to open ourselves up to multiple knowledge communities? And this is being done a lot in environmental science in order to, especially with traditional ecological knowledge, in order to, to, to open up our, our knowledge to, to, to other forms of expertise. So I think that although that, that one-way flow is important, I think that these, these institutions can also take us into this notion of engagement and, and that that takes it from a different role of, of the media um, as, as a disseminator uh, but into a much more uh, vibrant dialogue. And, and I think dialogue is really difficult for us at this present moment in time to, to grasp. So how would you balance, I mean, the, if you, you spent $300,000 to talk to 100 people versus, say, spending $300,000 to and make a website or something that might reach a much larger, I mean, because that's, I mean, it, my background is I do website development for NASA, um, actually working with very closely with a group of scientists. So we're sort of an outreach group embedded within the Earth Science at, at NASA Goddard. Um, and we, we would like to be much more two -way, of a two-way street. Um, but something like just opening up comments isn't going to work if you've ever read Real Climate. I mean, it just becomes this. A-B debate, and there's, there's very little actual transfer of information. Mm -hmm.
But on the other hand, like, okay, I could do a science cafe and that reaches 30 people. Mm -hmm. So how do you do both? I guess that's my big question. Well, I would say we reach more than 100 people. Oh, and, and, and I'm I think, exaggerating, but. But, but... But I think the, the role of documentary and film, which we haven't talked about, you know, what, what role can that play even in, 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 in emphasizing the importance of dialogue? Websites, um, these can have effects that, that become network effects that I think sometimes we're not even aware of, so that, that people talk, and I think that that's important in terms of those everyday conversations that's easy to overlook. So I would say that one of the things with engagement is that it does get people hands-on and involved in ways that, that putting up a website doesn't. And again, I'm not, I'm making this sound like it's a panacea. I'm not, it's a, it, it could fail too. Right. But, um, but I think our tendency is to really look at that dissemination model of communication and, and to broaden that in terms of what does it mean for engagement, two-way flows, um, and even multiple flows of, of expertise. Um, and, and so at least it broadens our range of opportunities if we think okay. that way. I would, I would just add that it, you know, in, in uh, strongly agreeing with Gwen that it's it's not it's not contained to just the hundred people uh, in that room in terms in terms of who's exposed to that event. Uh, the the idea would be that you're uh, you're generating news coverage of the event. Um, you have a documentary film that can then uh, go on the road and be shown to. Uh, you have a deliberative screening now, so you can show the film uh, at community groups or or similar type public forums. Um, and I've, I've pitched the idea that uh, we need to think about um, subsidizing the local media's ability to have strong substantive coverage by investing in uh, digital news communities at the local level on sustainability, energy, and the environment. And in that case, you have originally produced news by an independent editor and freelancers, uh, maybe one reporter, but you also have citizen journalists. You have members from that community who are posting their own views on sustainability, environment, and climate change at the local level or will not be going at the national level. And what we often find in the local media, the local digital media, is that the comment section isn't nearly as polarized in, in the national debates. I mean, if you look at real climate, that's part of the ideological uh, blogosphere. Um, and uh, you know, that's where you have the most, heat, the most heat. At the local level, you have a much more stronger kind of community solidarity often. You don't have the same type of partisan polarized views. I mean, you will have that, but then you also can think about the moderation of that comment section. So. Yeah, one of the uh, uh, factors that makes a big difference is uh, scientists who are, have tenure and they have gotten beyond the place where they can be, can be retribution that directly hurts them. And those people can speak their mind in ways that often junior scientists cannot. And I, I applaud your involvement of some of the Indian peoples. Uh, I think letting people understand what is going on in the high Arctic, what these poor folks are up against, you know, actually produce movies, for example, showing the collapse of their, of their buildings and showing um, they, they used to store their meat underground in the permafrost in the summertime. Can't do that anymore because the permafrost is melting and these freezing uh, units essentially are filling up with seawater. So there's some really big things going on and uh, you know having a way of bringing people for example to Jacobshaven where the seven percent of the outlet glacial ice is coming from Greenland. I mean there are ice quakes there, Richter six and seven ice quakes there virtually every day. I mean that's a whole different level of appreciation than just you know some vague uh, concept, so I, I would very much imp implore that we have some kind of a travel business. There is already a, a cruise, a uh, German cruise ship through the Northwest Passage every day, every year, and uh, so that's going on. But I mean, there are other areas that you could go into that would give people a direct idea, and these are the the kind of people who can afford trips like that are influential people, generally speaking. I would just add that as really, I mean, it's a very significant point, and, and, and to the point in the future that virtual reality technology will allow us to, 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 to enable people to have that experience without actually leaving their, their community. Yeah. I think, Max, you're going to. It's another it. thing to feel the, the Richter six or seven ice quake. Yeah. And we'll, we'll move to the last question, but Max, I think you're going to. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to point out there is, a, there is an activity that I've been involved with over at the University of Oxford to, for the previous three years called Tipping Points. And it's a Cape Farewell project where they actually have taken artists, it combines one of your earlier points about bringing in the humanities, 
has brought artists to the high Arctic, to Greenland, just brought them to Amazonia uh, before. And then from that, they've then produced artwork that relates to what they've seen. And that can be a way to maybe uh, expand those spheres of influence into these issues. And it's a, I, I've gotten behind it as a creative way to be engaging with, with climate change communication. And you can go on the web and, and have a look at, at those projects. Hi, my name is Caitlin Chell. I actually am an AGU staff member. I work in the Public Affairs Department uh, along with my colleague Liz Landau, right over there. Uh, anyway, AGU, uh, as many people probably don't know, has teamed up with several other science societies like AAAS, American Chemical Society, a whole bunch of us, and we have a tiny little lobbying movement to make sure that climate science is present and prominent during the climate debate on Capitol Hill. Uh, what we are hearing is a little sad um, that legislators really need help debunking climate change myths so that they can defend their votes to their constituents. And one of the things that we hear repeatedly is that they, um, I'm not sure how to phrase this, sorry. Um, they, so they want this help, you know, debunking these myths and um, they're not sure how to respond to their constituents about it. And, um, and so we've, we've gone on this trend of, you know, bringing in scientists and helping them debunk these myths. And I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, oh, I know what I was going to say, sorry. So what they are saying, though, is that they are not hearing from their constituents who are scientists. They are hearing from industry stakeholders, from constituents who are concerned that climate change isn't happening, so we shouldn't do anything about it. But they are not hearing from the scientists in their district, in their home state, doing the research. And so I think a very simple outreach thing that scientists could do is literally just write op-eds, letters to the editor in their newspapers, and contact their congressional offices. These do not take large amounts of time. Um, they're very simple outreach things. And, and these legislators really do pay attention to local media. Um, you know, they, they review local media clips every day. And so I would really encourage people to get involved, even if it's just writing letters, um, that sort of thing, because they are not hearing from their scientists and their core group of their constituency, and they would really like to hear from their scientists' constituents. If I could just say, I, that's a good point. And one other thing to just throw in to that is for all of us just in our communities, get to know your local reporter on the, who covers these issues. And it's a lot of behind the scenes, you know, take this person out for coffee, have a conversation about what they're doing, what their constraints are, what their interests are, let them know what you're up to. I mean, it's a lot of this behind the scenes relationship building that contributes to, I think, better communication, better reporting. Uh, so along with your suggestions, which I think are good, this would be another straightforward way is just to get to know your local reporting team. I kind of wonder, it, the whole, this bilateral engagement seems very idealistic and you know, maybe in Denmark or in Canada, there's a hope of it actually working. But, you know, what does the focus group in Lagos, Nigeria come up with? And does the Nigerian government really give a crap? It, it just seems like what, what happens when you engage people and then ignore them? Don't they become bitter and disengage and just get disillusioned with the whole process? And if you're not going to listen to them in a policy setting way, like you said, you gave these recommendations to the negotiation team, but, you know, actually their positions have already been made up and they're not going to pay any attention to what you gave them in this particular conference. And so if you don't have some kind of a binding agreement between, you know, this is what the citizens that, that we informed decided they thought was a good idea, if you don't have some way of connecting that to what the government actually does in a democratic country, never mind China or Nigeria or, you know, Burma, what, what's the point ultimately of that engagement? Well, that's, that's a very good question and, and that's what I, I, I wanted to emphasize. This isn't a, a, a cure-all and, and that, that in some cases people have argued that this isn't the right way to go, particularly if you don't have those linkages. But, and, and it's a point for debate um, because there are many people who would, who would side on, on, on what I think is an implicit assumption behind your question, or position at least, is that why do this if you already don't have those linkages in a sense? Maybe we're not as, as democratic as, as Denmark. So we're not Denmark, so let's not try. But 
that's where I want to come back to multi-level governance is that sure the the intent was in a sense one one um, audience me focus was policymakers but I think it's much broader than that and that um, our entire history of social movements had they based their uh, their efforts on on the claim that well if our structure doesn't support it then we shouldn't try I think we'd be in a pretty frightening place right now and we never would have had social so social change happens in ways that is is difficult to understand sometimes that, that hits a if I'll use the term tipping point I guess and you and it's really difficult to have a, a formula for that so so I think on one hand we have to try and we have to try to get these changes sometimes they won't work and 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 who knows what a failure is maybe it's redefining what success and failure are um, but I think but I don't want to negate that is a really important point sometimes the cost isn't worth it and, and, and it's hard to know in advance. So it, it's keeping that tension between is this the right way to, to go about it, doing a, a public engagement initiative? But also I think that we, in a sense that if we open ourselves up to the possibility that we can change our structures, then, then maybe it does have other t implications. I'll just add, add real, real quick that you know, if you can increase the volume of people that participate in these types of exercises, especially at the local level, and the frequency of these types of initiatives, the research is, is pretty clear that when people participate in these types of initiatives, they come away, they're more trusting of, 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 of science organizations. They feel more efficacious and that they believe that uh, if they do participate uh, and get involved on the issue, it will make a difference. Uh, and they're much more likely to participate in the future on the issue in terms of community level activities. And there's various levels of learning that go on that uh, go beyond what people normally informally learn through the mass media. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of other than its impact on ultimate impact on policy decisions as a communication vehicle and tool. There are a lot of outcomes that go beyond a lot of the polarization that the media creates. So. I'm uh, Mark Boslow. I'm here from Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I appreciate what you're doing. I really enjoyed your presentations. Um, I couldn't leave without making a comment or two. Sure. And, and I had one idea. The, the AGU folks were talking about engagement of AGU members and scientists with their representatives in, in Congress. And it would be great. I, I would love to do that, but I never get called. But, I, but I'm wondering if, <laughs> if AGU could like, create a list of AGU members who have expertise in various areas and make those names available to members of Congress, because I'd be happy to take a call from <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> so, um, and let's see, the, oh, I wanted to point out we were talking about engagement of scientists in the arts. And I participated in something um, last month called the Catalyst Workshop. It was at the American Film Institute um, in LA. And I think it was originally funded by the Sloan Foundation. They did three years. Um, and then they had a hiatus. They didn't have funding, and they started it up again this year, uh, apparently with anonymous funding. And they accepted 10 scientists into this program to try to come up with scientific, scientifically realistic screenplays. And they actually paired us up with professional screenwriters who would take our ideas and turn it into a, to a screenplay. They're getting paid, and they have a deadline by the end of January. They actually have to have 120 pages of screenplay. Um, so you can uh, you go to the American Film Institute website and look at Catalyst Workshop and there's some videos and things there. So there are, there are some attempts along these lines. And then finally, um, I, I had a comment about the whole framing issue. And it seems to me, you know, that the, the skeptic side or the denialist side has, you know, this, this loots memo or whatever that memo was that you showed. Yeah, the Luntz memo. Luntz memo. Um, I mean, they, they have a very, um, a, a strategy of spin, whereas scientists, we don't tend to be um, very astute politically. You know, we use our technical jargon and so forth. And we've allowed ourselves, I think, to get sucked into the, the simple uh, framing that's really been controlled, I think, by the denialist side and the media immediately. Um, accepts that. Um, just the fact that they call themselves skeptics, to me that's not a proper use of the term skeptic. I consider myself a skeptic. I'm, you know, I, like Carl Sagan used to say, you know, extraordinary um, claims require extraordinary evidence. And really the extraordinary claim is that you can change the infrared opacity of the atmosphere and nothing happens. Um, 
and I, I tend to call them zero warming believers, casting the you know, blind belief on, onto that group, the burden of proof is really on them. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of framing along those lines that if the scientists were more consistent and kind of refused to play by the framing that's been imposed upon us, we might be a little more effective. Even the term climate gate, um, I mean, the Luntz memo, you know, that should be climate gate when that was released. Um, you know, the, that's, that's where the conspiracy to kind of create uncertainty where it doesn't exist, that seems to be where that comes from. So, that's all. So I think that, uh, one more question, yeah, and and I just think that, uh, and I think the the climate skeptic movement is 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 one part of the puzzle for societal inaction. But I, I think it's important not to um, uh, to uh, overestimate the responsibility for societal inaction. I think they're one factor among many. Um, but uh, I have two questions. Uh, I did participate in the AGU uh, volunteer, uh, but. There were, uh, the rules said that we were supposed to give only scientific facts and not give any opinions. And I, I, I did that, but the answers seemed pretty bland to myself. And I kept thinking, I'm not sure the journalists would be interested in those answers. But today, listening to all of you speaking, I had some ideas of how I could have made the answer more interesting. And I kind of wish that if there was some sort of training beforehand that included these ideas, I could have done a lot better job in, in whatever shift I work. So my one suggestion was maybe put something together like a training or a write-up that would, for example, putting, putting the ideas in terms of health effects or putting the ideas in terms of solutions. I mean, there were some really good ideas that if I was to work next year again for this volunteer thing, I would like to read that before uh, volunteering the... Right. So, um, so I think, Max, you probably I would say, say something quickly. Uh, for those in the audience that are not familiar with the journals, uh, Science Communication and Public Understanding of Science, most universities subscribe to those journals. And many of the issues that were discussed today, research articles and, and overview articles appear there. But in the recent issue of Science Communication, there is a, a shorter article evaluating an EU-funded um, seminar series for scientists that uh, is a week long. It trains them in basic communication skills, uh, but also covers social science research, such as in uh, how the media covers science, uh, things like framing, and then also more of these normative questions about public engagement. What is public engagement? What is the role of science institutions? What does it mean to have democratic decision-making on science? And also some of the more uh, philosophical and sociological questions about science. So I strongly recommend checking out that, that, that article, and I think it's a blueprint for what could be done really, really well uh, here in the United States uh, with some funding. And just a plug for AU, uh, we do have some plans to try to uh, start some of those seminars, and one of our new faculty members next year was, uh, was the project manager on that, that EU-funded uh, project, Declan Fahey, coming from Ireland. So we hope to have some, some training programs available. Max, I think you were saying something. Yep. Uh, that that I definitely agree with that. I I also there are some other programs out there. Maybe they're not communicated well enough. But there is the Aldo Leopold Fellowship Program. Depending on where what stage you're in in your research, there's also this uh, discourse program that's NSF funded. Just got three more years. Um, Sue Weiler was here earlier, and I think that she left some materials in the back. I'm always happy to talk more about some of the some of the opportunities that I've heard about. So, um, but. And there are spaces where many of these get posted, but I think it's still a pretty fragmented landscape. And, and so, you know, American University Initiative, these sorts of things are certainly welcome. And another question was related to the study you uh, mentioned, the categories of uh, quality, tabloid, and prestige press. My question was how much, like, what's the proportion of the population in U.S. or in U.K. that these categories reach to? And is there any connection between 
where the information is published and does it make any actual difference? I mean, does it make a difference uh, in people's day-to-day decision-making where they find that information? And uh, yeah. did you find such any such connections in your study? I, I haven't found the connections in my research. I hadn't really been looking for the connections between behavioral change and media representations. It's a very rocky road between them. Um, some other groups have tried to make those connections. In, in terms of your question, the circulation rates in the UK, you know, The Guardian has about 250,000, 300,000 uh, of average daily circulation, whereas The Sun is 3.3 million, The Mail is 2.2, and so much greater numbers reading those uh, papers. There was, I have to stretch to remember where I saw this, but I think it was the Institute for Public Policy Research in the UK had done a survey of concern for climate change and which newspapers they read. And <clears throat> they had found that, you know, if you read The Guardian and The Independent, if you read uh, some of these newspapers, your state of concern for climate change is much greater. The question remains, though, is it a product of having read those newspapers or is it already your pre-existing belief mm -hmm. system that led you to some of these what are considered ideologically left of center uh, publications. So there has been work that's been done, but you know, I don't, you two may have many things to say about how challenging it is to make the connections between behavioral change, attitudinal change, and and uh, consumption of of uh, texts. Okay. And just one suggestion for. I thought that study was really impressive, but I mean. I'm not sure how many people actually know about it. So it would be great if you put something on YouTube or something like that. Oh, you mean for the, the, the consultation? Yeah, we've, the yeah, we've you put it on YouTube and we have a Facebook and we have okay. tw twitted, tweeted and twittered and uh, <laughs> we have tried to do a lot. It's interesting, we really had a struggle and this was something that we had a struggle engaging the media because a lot of people wouldn't take this up because it was a non-event. And, 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 and I think I did actually get a, a, an interview with our, our local uh, television station just talking about these results, how we framed it in terms of Albertans going to Copenhagen and tried to make it as local as we could. And we got bumped for a story about a cat choking on a Christmas ribbon. So, <laughs> I mean, it's not just scientists who have a, a problem engaging the media. I think it's, you know, how it, we were really, we thought we did everything right. You know, we talked about framing, we talked about, we got our press releases out, we tried to engage with specific specific journalists and we would just get cut because people, well, nobody's interested in public engagement. So I think we're, we're out of time um, yeah. and uh, I, would, I would just say that last point really begs the need to really think seriously about how universities and, and government agencies can subsidize the ability of local media to